Okay, so the second section we're going to look at this week is 7.3. Uh, we're going to spend pretty much one day on it. We'll, that'll wrap this one up. And then 7.2, we're going to split that one into two days. Okay, so we'll do part on um, Wednesday, and we'll do the second part on Thursday. All right, so 7.3 is on using the graphing calculator to solve trig equations. Now, the calculator can do a lot of the like intersection for us, but we still have to know, we still got to know a little bit about what we're plugging in, how to set a window, and how to write our final answer. Okay, so the calculator can't, it can't tell us everything, okay, but it can help us with quite a bit. Now, keep in mind that um, when you're finding a solution to a trig equation, so let's say I wanted to solve this one. Okay, I'm, you don't have to write this one down because I'm not, I'm not going to do it exact. You put one side in y1, you put the other side in y2. What does sine x look like if you grab it? Yeah, it's, it's a wave. Okay. So if you were to keep you know, zooming out, it's going to look like that. And what about point three? Right, what's that going to look like? It's just going to be a horizontal line at the number point three. Well, one one is the highest, so it's somewhere right there. So, how many times, if you could zoom out forever, how many times is, does the wave and the line cross? Right, infinitely many. This, what I just put a box around, is exactly one, does anybody remember what you call that? Mm -hmm. That's one period, one cycle. How many times does the line cross per cycle? Twice. Twice. We'll call it like the red answer and the blue answer. So you get the red answer and the blue answer in every cycle. Now, how often is the red answer going to repeat in general? It's going to repeat every what? Every cycle. every cycle. So we have to figure out how long is a cycle. It's going to keep repeating at exactly the same interval. And the same with the blue answer. That answer is going to repeat every cycle. We just have to figure out how long is a cycle. So what we generally use the calculator to do is figure out the first two positive answers, because it also is going to repeat going back the other way, too. But we find the first two positive ones, and then we say that it repeats forever. That's the general idea. And that's what I just tried to explain to you. So first, find all the solutions in one cycle, one period. So that requires that you know how to figure out the period. Because if you can't, you're not going to be able to set your window. And then to find all the solutions, we have to take into account the fact that the answer repeats. This is pretty much what your solutions are going to look like. This part is going to come from the graphing calculator. Okay, so when you do second calc intersect, you'll get one solution. Then, to tell me that that solution repeats, you're going to put plus a period times n. Let me go back to the picture so you can kind of look at that. Well, I'm just going to make up an answer. Let's say that this first red answer occurred at, uh, let's say it was like 20 degrees. It's probably not going to usually come out to a nice number, but let's say it happened at 20 degrees. Does anybody remember what the cycle length of sine is? 
like how many degrees you have to travel? Three, how much? 360. So the next answer is 360 units later. So this answer is the first one plus 360. The next answer is the first one, but it's two cycles later. So it would be 360 times two. This answer would be whatever the first one was, plus how many cycles later is that answer? One, two, three cycles, and every cycle is 360. So in general, the way you would write this answer, the red answer, repeating forever, 20 plus 360 times n. That's how you would represent every single answer. And n can be any integer that you want. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. It depends how many cycles later you want the answer. And if you want all of them, just leave it as the letter n, and you're done. Yeah? So is, is the first cycle cycle 0? Um, so in the first cycle, yeah, this would be like plus 360 times 0. You're not adding anything to it. It's the very first one. And then if you want to go one cycle later, you do 360 times 1. Two cycles later, three cycles later. And if n is a negative number, that will give you earlier cycles. So effectively, it covers everything. It's every, every solution. You have to write something like this for every single intersection point. So in this one, there's a red answer and there's a blue answer we would still have to do the blue one in that box. Okay. But there'd only be two. Two answers per cycle. Now, let's say we weren't doing it in degrees. I want you to think what 360 degrees is in radians. OK, so I was just asking right before I paused it, uh, what's 360 degrees the same as? Two pi radians. Two pi radians, yep. So if you were doing this problem in radians, you wouldn't put plus 360 in. Yeah, uh, You'd put plus 2 pi in. Right? All right, so let's, let's actually let's try this one. Okay. Kind, of, kind of like the sine of x equals 0 0.3, but this one's 0 0.8. Um, and the key that you know you have to do something like this is they put the word off. Okay, you have to find all solutions. All right. So who can tell me what's going to go in? Um, yeah. What's going to go in Y one? What is it? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So in Y one, you're going to put sine of x. Um, what are you going to put in Y two? Yep. Point eight. And now we want to make sure when we set it up, we're only looking at one cycle. Okay, we're in um, we're in radians. Let's let's do the first one in degrees. Okay, so I'm just going to switch over to degrees. What should I set my window to if I want to see exactly one cycle? 360. It has to be a width of 360. So what should I use for a min and a max? Zero to yeah, I, I would generally do zero to whatever you need. Zero to three sixty. Now, what's the highest that sign goes? One. And what about the lowest? Negative one. Alright, so we don't need negative ten to ten. I would say negative two to two. That's gonna be fine. Okay, so we're gonna hit graph. It's gonna look very similar to the one I already drew on the board. So we've got a wave. Get a horizontal line. And how many answers do we get per cycle? <coughs> Two. So we're going to do second calc. Okay, I'm going to do the one on the left. Um, and somebody else can do the one on the right. So move your cursor closer to the one that you want. Hit enter. And the first answer is 53.13 degrees. 
And I'm going to call it x1. Okay, that's my first answer. 53.13 degrees. But if that's all you put, you haven't written all of them. You've only written the one in the first cycle. What do I put on the end of that to indicate that that answer repeats forever left and right? Plus 360. Yep. So plus 360. Yeah. And remember, n has to be an integer. You can add a whole multiple of 360, or you could subtract a whole multiple of 360. But you couldn't add like 360 times 0.5. 0.5 only gets you halfway through a cycle. You either can add one whole cycle to the answer or subtract one whole cycle. Okay, so n has to be an integer. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, things like that. Okay, um, what about the uh, the second intersection? It's about 126.87. Yeah. So that's in degrees. Now, that's just the answer on the screen. How do we indicate it repeats? Put plus 360 times n. Or you could just put 360 n. The letter that you use here isn't really important. I've seen the book use k. You know, it's just, it represent, represents any integer that you want it to be. Right, and that is every solution to this problem in degrees. If you wanted it in radians, the only difference is change the 360s to two pi's and recalculate these two numbers, but change the mode to radians. That's all you have to do to do it in radians. Okay, so any question on the first one? Okay. So, you might see the directions in the homework that say solve or find the roots. Okay, we use that word a lot at the beginning of the year. Find the roots of the equation. When you're finding the roots, that really just means to set the equation equal to one number. Zero. Zero. Yep. So that's just a reminder of, of what that means. So in algebra, if I said Take the following equation and find the roots. All I'm asking you to do is set it equal to zero and solve. Now graphically, when you find the roots, where, what are those in the graph? The roots are the, yeah? X-intercepts. They're the x-intercepts. Yep. So you're basically finding where the graph crosses the x-axis. So if I said find the roots of this equation, find the zeros of this equation, find the x-intercepts of this equation, find where this graph crosses the x-axis. I just asked the same question four different ways. Okay. Any question on what it means to Find the roots. Okay. So this one was easy to find the period for because we've studied it before. And we've just remembered that it's 360 degrees. Well, what if you have something a little more complicated? Okay. We've got, we're not going to do it yet because i got to explain something. We got two trig functions. Each one of these contributes to the period, the cosine squared and the sine. Well, we know the period of sine. We just did that in the last problem. But what does this cosine squared do to it? That's, that's what I'm going to show you. We've also never seen raising a trig function to a power. Well, I'm going to give you a table that explains how to find the period of any trig function whether it's raised to a power or not. And it's going to come down to whether it's an even or an odd number. Okay, that's, that's very important. All right, so how do you find the period of a more complicated equation? Okay, an equation that has more than one trig function in it. Well, the first
first thing you have to do is find the period of each periodic term. Under a periodic term, that's a trig term. So I'm going to go back to that example I had on the board for a second. That's, that's a periodic term. That's a periodic term. Plus one is a term, but it's not periodic. Plus one is a constant. So periodic terms are terms that have trig in them, not just numbers. That's not, that's not true. Yeah. What about the two and cosine squared? That's, that's part of the periodic term. Okay. Terms are separated by plus and minus signs. So you got three terms on the board there, two of which are periodic, one is not. Yep. All right, so find the period of each trig term. And then determine the LCL. Least common multiple. That's how you find the period of something more complicated. It's the least common multiple of all the individual periods. Okay, so just as a reminder, how do you find least common multiple? Um, let's say you have the two numbers, 3 and 7. And I said, what's the least common multiple? So multiples of 3, those are numbers like this. Okay, those, are, those are multiples of 3. And then multiples of 7. The least common multiple is the smallest number you can find in both of those lists. Um, so for 3 and 7, it would be 21. Yep. Now, we're going to be dealing with periods. When you deal with the period um, in radians, what's usually in the period? This thing is usually part of the period. Pi. Right? Usually pi is in there somewhere. So instead of 3 and 7, let's say you had to find the LCM of 2 pi and 3 pi. Well, it's really just like finding the LCM of 2 and 3. And I'm putting pi on. So multiples of 2 pi, 2 pi times 1, 2 pi times 2, times 3, times 4. Okay, those are multiples of 2 pi. Uh, multiples of 3 pi, times 1, 2, 3, 4. So what do you think the least common multiple of 2 pi and 3 pi would be? Six pi. Six pi, yeah. So if you were doing a problem and one of the terms had a period of two pi and the other one had a period of three pi, then the whole thing would have a period of six pi. So find the individual periods first, then find the least common multiple. All right, so now we have to have a little bit more about that step. How do you find the period of each term? Well, there's really two, two different cases okay, that, that are going to happen. The formula that we use most of the time to find the period is pi over b. I should, I should put the b in all of these. b is the number that is always right next to x. The number that's right next to x. So if you have sine, cosine, secant, or cosecant to an even power, or any tangent or cotangent, even or odd, that's how you find the period. Pi divided by b. I put absolute value of b. I don't think we're ever going to have one where b is negative, but if you did, you don't use the negative. Okay. So let's say I wanted to find the period of sine squared. That would fit into this pattern. It's sine to an even power. Sine to an even power. What's the b value in sine squared x? 
what what's right in front of the X? One. Yeah, it's just a one in this case. Right, you don't see anything there, it's just a one. So the period of this one, it says sine to an even power. Use this formula. Pi divided by B. So it's going to be pi divided by what? One. one. So the period is just pi. That means the sine squared function repeats itself every pi radians. Um, what would that be in degrees? What's pi? 180. 180. Yeah. So it repeats itself every 180 degrees. Now the only other formula is 2 pi over b, and that's used for anything that's not up there. So what what's not up there? Sine to an odd, cosine to an odd, secant to an odd, or cosecant to an odd. That's when you use 2 pi over b. So most of the time, it's pi over b. Okay, you use pi over b a lot more. But in those four situations, you use 2 pi over b. Right, so let's say I had um, sine cubed 2x. And I wanted to find the period. Okay, first thing I check out is sine to an odd power figure out if it's the top or the bottom formula. Sine to an odd. That's the bottom formula. So you're going to use 2 pi over b. What's, what's b in this case? 2. The number in front of x is a 2. So fill in a 2 for b and do 2 pi over 2. And what would happen there? Yeah, the twos would cancel, and the period would be pi. So the period of sine cubed 2x is just pi. So this takes pretty much all the, all the guesswork out of figuring out the period. You either use that, or you use that. So any question on which which formula to use when? For tangent and cotangent, you can use that or? No, for tangent and cotangent, you have to use pi over b. Okay. Yeah, there are no tangent or cotangents ever involved with this bottom formula. Only sines, cosines, secant, and cosecant. Tangent and cotangent, you have to use the top. Does everybody have that chart? Okay, so let's try a uh, problem now where we, we have to figure out the period of each term, find the LCM, and then we do the intersects. So using the graphing calculator is really going to be the last thing we do. There's a lot of things we do before we even touch the graphing calculator and put this all in Y1. So we're going to start by finding the period of each thing underlined in red. Plus 1 doesn't have a period. It's a constant term. It's got to be a trig term. Okay, the first one is cosine to an even power. What's the formula we use when it's cosine to an even power? Pi over b. Pi over b. And b is the number that's in front of the argument. So what, here's your argument, you know, I just put it in parentheses, what number is in front of the t? One. One. Okay. I don't care about the number in front, that's a vertical stretch. Vertically stretching doesn't do anything to the period. It just makes it taller or shorter. So this number has nothing to do with the period. Just what's inside. Yeah. So period of the first term is pi. And now technically this is signed to an odd power. It doesn't have one. When it doesn't have one, we assume it's one. 
What's the period of just regular sine to the first power? 2 pi. Now, I need the LCM. What's the least common multiple of 1 pi and 2 pi? 2 pi. 2 pi. Yep. The least common multiple cannot be smaller than the individual ones. The least common multiple has to be at least as big as both. And in this case, it is 2 pi. Now, this 2 pi tells you a couple things. One, it tells you what you're going to put on the end of each answer. You're going to put plus 2 pi n on every answer that we do. Second thing it tells you is your window. Before I even put the formula in, I need to set a window that's one cycle. What could I use for a min and a max that would give me a width of 2 pi? Yeah, we're going to do radians, so we're going to do 0 to 2 pi. I'm going to switch over to radians. And let's do about just a little bit. Let's do like, I don't know, let's do like negative 4 to 4. Okay, so we got our 0 to 2 pi. We got negative 4 to 4. I'm going to change my mode before I forget to put it in radians. And now we have to type that all in. I'm going to put the whole thing in Y1 because it's all on one side. This is how you have to type in cosine squared. 2 times cosine squared. That's how you have to put it in. You can't put a 2 like in the middle above the word cosine on a graphing calculator. You have to put it at the end. I might have talked about that yesterday. I think. Maybe not. I don't know. So you start with that. And then do plus sine x. And then plus 1. Okay. So that is exactly what you should have in y1. Okay, we already got the window set, so we're going to hit graph. Remember, it's not going to be a perfect wave because it's multiple trig functions. It's going to be a little more complicated looking. Still going to have a pattern that repeats, but it's not exactly a perfect wave. Okay, so let's look at what that looks like. That's what your graph looks like. So the idea is if you were to draw another cycle, you take this section, and if you set your window correctly, the end should match up exactly with the beginning. If I copy the cycle, just like that. And that's what the graph is going to do. It's going to keep repeating just like that. All right, now we are checking to see where the graph hits what number? Zero. Right, zero. I don't have to put in an intersection here at zero. So normally you've got to do like a y1 and a y2, but the calculator can figure out where it crosses the axis without putting anything extra. So I can't use intersect because I didn't put in another line. But what could I use? Zero. Yeah, I can calculate the zero. What you might want to do is zoom in a little bit and see if it dips below the line. It, it never does. But if you zoomed in and that section did dip below the line a little bit, let's say it went like that and you could only see it by zooming in, then you'd end up with two answers. But I just know from doing this one, it doesn't dip below. So there's, there's only one answer. Now, that one answer, what do, you, what do you call this spot right here? There's another, another name for that. Yeah? Local min. Yeah, it's a local minimum. Sometimes when the graph comes down and it just barely touches the axis and it goes back up like that, you can't find it doing a zero. Right? I think on our graphing calculators, 
To find it using a zero, it actually has to cross, go below, and then come back up. Okay? Or it has to, you know, cross it like that. But it, it has to cross. Touching it, the calculator won't count. So let's let's try to calculate the zero and let's see what happens. Pick a point that you know is to the left. Pick a point you know is to the right. Yeah, I went way far to the left. It's okay. And then try to put the cursor about where you think the, the guess is, right in there. All right, it found it. I wasn't, I wasn't sure where. But it, it did. If it didn't find it, what I would have done is second calc minimum. And then it would have found it. So it's 4.71. All right, so let's write that down. So now by writing that, you've given me one answer, but I want all of them. So what are you going to put on the end of that? Right, plus your period, plus your LCM, times M. So the next time you will get an answer will be 4.71 plus 2 times pi. And the next answer would be plus another 2 times pi. And you could keep adding two times five. Okay, that's how you do it. Any question on that? Let's try this. Okay, tangent x equals three cosine x. Now let's let's do it the same way we did the last one. The last problem we had it set up so that what number was on one side. Zero. Okay, let's do the same thing. Let's get everything on one side, and then we can do it the same way. How would I get zero on one side? Yeah, we could subtract the tan x. It really doesn't matter which way you do it. You need to subtract something and just move it to the other side. No matter which way you do it, you'll get the same answer. So that's gone. And what's on the right side now? 3 cosine x minus tan x. Let's put that in. We're very far from being able to hit graph, but we can, we can put it in now if we want. 3 cosine x minus tangent x. Okay, so that's what you type in. But before we hit graph, we got to set our window. To set our window, we need the period. Okay. What's the period of cosine x? This is like cosine to an odd power. It would be 2 pi over b. But in this case, what number is in front of x? Yeah, it's just a 1. Okay, we are going to do one where there's not a 1 in front of x. But for now, it's a 1. So that's 2 pi. What's the period of tangent to an odd power? Pi over b. And what's b in this case? Yep, so it's like there's a 1 right there. And now what's the least common? I'm just going to move that down. What's the least common multiple? 2 pi. Okay, so again, that tells you two things. It tells you what to set your window to. Set it so it's a width of 2 pi. We already have it. And that's what you're going to add on the end of each answer at the end of the problem. 2 pi n. All right. Now, when we graph tangent, remember, tangent has vertical asymptotes. That means the graph is going to go off the screen. So it doesn't really matter how high and low you set your line in. You're never going to be able to see the whole thing. So here's a vertical asymptote right in there. And there's going to be another one right over there. So we're looking for where this equals 0. We're finding the roots, finding the x-intercepts. How many times does it cross the x-axis per cycle? Twice. Twice. Okay, and that looks good. 
because if I were to draw this whole thing and copy and paste it, this point would line up perfectly with that. Kind of think like if you bend the screen around, these two points on the left and the right, they should touch each other. All right, so let's find it. Okay, I'm going to do, uh, okay, I'll do the second one. If somebody can, uh, you guys can do the first one, let me know what that one comes out to. But the second one is 2.13. Okay, and I already took care of the plus 2 pi n to indicate it repeats every cycle. On the other answer, I can put the plus 2 pi in. I just need to know what the intersection point is. 1.01. All right. 1.01. And that's how you write all solutions. Any uh, question on? Let's try that one. And... Okay, so let's do the periods. Sine to an odd power. What's the formula for sine to an odd? It's 2 pi over b. What's b in this case? 2. That's your b right there. 2 pi over 2. So what's the period of sine cubed 2x? Pi. Okay. How about regular cosine x? No, no exponent, no period change, nothing. It's just 2 pi. And we've seen that a lot. Okay, pi and 2 pi, they do seem to come up quite a bit when you do this. Um, doesn't always have to, but it, it does a lot. What's the least common multiple? Okay. So that's what I need to put on the end of every answer, and that's what I need to set my window to. Okay, well, my window's good. That's already set. Okay, I'm going to clear out anything I had in there. And we've got to be careful when we put in that cubed. We don't want to cube the 3 in the front. That 3 in the front, we don't want that to become a 27. That's what would happen if you cube it. So make sure that that is outside parentheses. So three. Now I'm going to put in parentheses what I'm going to cube. Sine 2x. So inside the parentheses. Sine 2x. Close the parentheses for the 2x argument. Close the parentheses for what I want to cube. That's how you type it in. So it should look just like that. If that 3 was inside the parentheses next to the sign, it would be what's part of being cubed, and we don't want that. Yep? Would it have any real effect on the answer since the vertical, since they would just stretch it? Uh, it would do a vertical stretch. You're not affecting the zero points there. Yeah, it might, might not affect the zeros because it's not moving it left or right. But we still don't want to mess up putting anything extra in there. Um, but yeah. Okay, so let's... Uh, we got it in, we got our window, let's hit graph. Okay, so we're looking for all the times it crosses the x-axis. It should end right at the height that it started at. So it should end right where I'm pointing. Roughly. Right there. Okay, we, it goes a little off the screen. That, that's not a big deal because we're not looking for maximums or minimums. We're looking for it crosses. Okay. Um, how many times does it look like it crosses? Yeah, I'd say you got one, two, three, four, five, six. That's that's a lot of answers. We normally don't get them. So I already have them all 
figured out, so we don't have to do second calc intersect, but you'd have to do it on this one six times. Okay, I'd say on a test, probably two times, three times, that's pretty standard. Uh, six would be a lot. Okay. Uh, but let me just write down what the answers are. Right, so we got, first one is at 0.5. The next one is 1.25. Next one is 1.57. What's this? 1.89, getting pretty close to the second tick mark, which is at 2. Um, the next one is 2.65. That's this one over here. And the last one is 4.71, which is almost at 5, the fifth tick mark. Now this notation I'm about to use, it's not really like formal, but I'm just gonna say x is about, and I'm just gonna put a big, instead of writing plus two pi n six times, I'm just gonna say you can add two pi n to any of those. Since on the test, you're only gonna have like two or three at most, you could just do plus two pi n two or three times. But those are your six answers. Okay. Any question on? Okay. All right. So last, last one. So the last problem we're going to do is an inequality. Remember, when you solve an inequality, you pretty much do it exactly the same way you do an equation. So let's look at this last one. And let's say, instead of me asking you, where is it exactly zero, which is what these answers are, let's say I asked you, where is it above zero? Well, above zero would be from here to here, from here to here, and from here to there. There are three sections where that graph is above zero. When you have to describe a section of a graph, you can't write a single number. You have to write a section. What, what do we call a section? Sometimes we have like a comma, we have like a comma, and we have like brackets or parentheses. Mm -hmm. An interval, yes. So the only thing that's different is when you're trying to describe where something is an interval, you have to tell me where does the interval start. Let's just call this interval 1. Interval 1 starts at 0.5, and it ends at 1.25. That's interval 1. And when you have to write another interval, because there's also an interval 2, and there's an interval 3, all of those intervals are above 0. What do we normally put after this interval to indicate there's another section? The u. Yep. And then you'd write interval 2, which is the 1, 2, 3rd, and 4th intersection point for the start and the stop. 1.57 to 1.89. That's interval two. And in interval three is the fifth to the sixth. 2.65 to 4.71. Okay, we're not going to do one that has three. We might have one with two. But that's the only difference. You still have to find all these numbers. But now you just have to write the answer as an interval instead of just a single number. If your graph has a vertical asymptote, let me see if we have one. I thought we did. Maybe I didn't uh, put it on the board. No. All right. Well, let's just make one up. 
let's say your graph has a vertical asymptote. So it kind of does something like this, curves up. Did you say the inequality is where the period goes, if anywhere? Yeah, well, I'll show you how you do the period. You do it exactly the same way. You just write the interval, and then you just put a plus 2 pi in. But you do exactly. So you write the interval, and then below it, that's how you represent that interval repeating. Because this interval is going to repeat again right over there. Yep. So you just put plus 2 pi in. But let's say you had something like this. And I wanted you to tell me where the graph is above 0. Well, it's above 0 from here. Notice what I just had to do. I trace this. I need to get down to this other section. Can I get down here without lifting the, the pencil? No. no. If I lift my pencil and I have to go down to here, when I lift my pencil, that breaks my interval. I can't describe that green section as one giant interval because there's, there's a vertical asymptote right in the middle of it. So I had to lift my pencil. So that's interval one. Lift, back down, that's interval two. It's impossible for me to write it as one continuous interval because it's not. I had to lift my pencil and put it back. Okay, so vertical asymptotes break your interval. And the vertical asymptote is going to be very easy to find. It's not going to be a tricky number. It's either going to be a pi or two pi all the time. Could it be other places? Yes, I could give you very hard ones. But it's always going to be a pi or two pi. So you'll be able to tell with the calculator which one it is. I have to have something like this. Yeah. Alright, so let's try. Yeah, let's try this one. Find all solutions. Sin x is less than cotangent x. Okay, so that's going to go in y1. That's going to go in y2. Okay, well, y1, that's pretty easy. Sin x. And actually, we, we talked about this yesterday. Cotangent. There's two different ways I can put cotangent into y2. What's one way that I could do it? Yeah? One over tangent. Yeah, we could do one over tangent. You could also do cosine over sine. That would work exactly the same. So let's do one over tangent. Right, let's, get our, um, let's get our window ready. What's the period of sine? Two pi. Two pi. Okay, these are both just regular trig functions. There's no powers, there's no numbers in front of x. Period of regular sine is 2 pi. How about regular cotangent? Pi. You could think of it as cotangent to an odd power. Okay, the formula is pi over b. But there's no b, so it's just 1. Okay, what's the least common multiple? 2 pi. Okay, so let's get our window set up. Uh, 0 to 2 pi, that looks good. Cotangent has a vertical asymptote in it, so you're not going to be able to see the top and the bottom of the screen. So I'm just going to do negative 4 to 4. Uh, okay, we got the window, we got everything typed in. Let's hit graph. So we're looking for where the blue wave is under the red graph. So let's put that up and let's see if that ever happens. So, is the blue wave ever underneath the red graph? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it is. Uh, is it one section, two sections, three se How many sections is the blue wave under the red graph? Uh, remember, think of it, let me put in the vertical asymptote. So you've got a vertical asymptote right here. So whatever you do, 
that's going to break your interval. You can't. Just think about tracing along the red graph. You've got to lift your pencil and put it back down. All right. So how many intervals is the blue one under the red one? Two. Two. Yeah, there's a section from here to here. Let's call that section one. But then it goes above the red wave. And it stays above it until we get to the vertical asymptote. Any question why the blue wave is above in this section? But then, right after the vertical asymptote, it does go back below until you get to right there. Those are the two sections where the blue wave is under the red graph. Now, can it equal the red graph, or does it have to be under? It has to be under. So really, you want to think of that as like an open circle and an open circle. All right. So let's let's write our intervals. Um, how many intervals do we have? We've got two. So I know I'm going to need that. Now, where does interval one start? Zero. Right. Starts at zero. Do we include zero, or do we not include it? Yeah, we can't include it because to include it, right, you've got to compare where sine is under cotangent. Right? You need a number here and a number here in order to know if one is less than the other. Where is the blue graph when x is zero? What's the y value? Right. The blue graph is at zero. Where is the red graph? That's a vertical asymptote. That's a vertical asymptote, so we can't really talk about that. If you were to try to figure out where the red graph is on the calculator, it would say error. So you can't really compare zero to error. Okay, the red graph, the red, the red graph doesn't even exist at zero. It's it's a vertical asymptote. So you can't you can't include zero. Right? But it does start at zero. Now, how am I going to figure out where interval one stops? Intercept. Right, I need the intercept. So I can do second calc intercept. Move your cursor close. If somebody can find that second intersect, that would be helpful eventually. So it intersects at 0 0.90. Can we include or not include 0 0.90? Yeah, you can't include it. That's an open circle. If this had an equal to under it, then yes, you could include it. But it, it doesn't. Okay, so we can't include where they're equal. Okay, that's interval one. Okay, interval two. Well, let's at least figure out where it stops. Stops right there. That's where they cross. Where does interval two stop? 5.38. Okay, now we need where interval two starts. Interval two starts right on a what? Starts right on an asymptote. So can you include it? No, you can never include it when it's on an asymptote. What did we set the window to? What was, the window was 0 to 2 pi. I told you it would be pretty easy to figure out where the asymptote is. Where does it look like it is? Pi. Yeah, it's right in the middle. It's right at pi. That's where interval 2 starts. You could confirm it's at pi because if you go to your table and you type in pi, you're going to get an error. The red graph has an asymptote at pi. There. Now, if that's all you put, all you've done is tell me the answer in that first cycle. Section one and two are going to repeat. Those two sections are going to repeat again over here. <coughs> How often will they repeat? Those two intervals are going to repeat every two pi forever. So on each interval, all we have to do is put 
You can add 2 pi n to both numbers there, and both numbers there. So that represents 2 pi n to the whole interval. Okay, any question on that? Yeah? That's the correct notation for that, writing it under. Uh, well, it's not really formal mathematical notation. You would probably see it written like this in the book. That's how you'd probably see it. I just kind of did it like that so I don't have to write it twice. Does that make sense, though? Right, but you want us to write it like you wrote it first? Yeah, you could write it either way. The first way is a little shorter. Okay. Yeah. Again, is it really something formal? Uh, no. Okay, so let me put up um, homework. Let me just double check it. I am going to change it just a little bit. Okay, 12 through 15, they're asking you to find the answers. This is in the book from 0 to 2 pi. That's not all solutions. You don't have to put plus 2 pi in. You just set your window to 0 to 2 pi, and you just write the numbers you see. You don't have to write all the solutions. That's actually a little easier. Uh, 19 to 23. That's OK. Uh, That's what we want. So 5, 7, 12 to 15, 19 to 23, just odds, and then 29 and 30. 